Hello, welcome to Mark Langley's Horsemanship Podcast, a podcast helping people to understand their horses better, to provide solutions in a calm, connected way. I'm Jenny Barnes. And I'm Mark Langley. Mark, I know you've been busy travelling all the way through the southern end of New South Wales and down through Victoria, doing five-day clinics, three-day clinics, two-day clinics, everywhere, um, keeping yourself very busy. I just want to read a comment to you from Karen. She's recently been on one of your clinics and she said that she wanted to thank you for getting us back on track. It has only been five days since we returned home, but there's been a huge change in her horse, Murphy, mostly due to her new approach, It's Not Personal, and carrying a magpie. He's already less confused by my behaviour, body language, and happier and more relaxed around me with a lot fewer cranky faces. I was not enjoying my time with him at all to the point I was thinking of finding him a new home, but now I'm looking forward to bringing him back into ridden work and achieving some goals. So I just thought I'd share that with you, and it's a really nice story. So well done, Karen, to you. This podcast today is going to be all about leading, uh, which is one of Mark's areas that he really highly rates. And we're going to talk, um, Mark's going to talk through some questions that have come through from some members. And we're going to go into a lot of detail, um, quite specific areas that they're having problems with, with their leading. But first of all, Mark, I just want you to give us a recap on on leading. It's integral to a lot of the work that you do, and you can see the benefits of getting leading right. Can you just let everyone know, just very briefly in a few points, why you think leading is just so essential to really make sure that it's working? Well, um, le- leading is not just, you know, a horse, you know, following us along with a lead rope. It's uh, it's the basis of a horse um, following the feel of pressure and also having pressure on it and understanding how to sort of softly yield its thoughts and accept that pressure um, and mould its mind and body around that pressure. So leading is integral to steering a horse. So when we hold a rein, the horse is confident to sort of follow the feel of that, the, the, the pressure of the rein. Um, and it's, it, it gets through the horse to its feet, so it's very good for taking brace out of horses because basically um, it's, it's, it's basically leading is the function of rebalancing and staying in balance. Um, and it also is very good for horses accepting boundaries and things like that. So leading, how you lead a horse is how a horse loads in a float, uh, how it travels in a float even um, because the boundaries of a float, um, if a horse can softly move off the feel of a of a uh, you know, a chest bar and a breaching bar, and the, and and um, and in in that sort of boundary inside a horse float, then it's then it, then it becomes soft in there. And I think leading, uh, accepting pressure, and in, in leading is what what helps our horses with that. And uh, leading leads to things like leading with a belly rope and stuff like that. And uh, and I think um, Tom Dron said one day there shouldn't be a place you you can't put a rope on a horse and. Uh, I think well, maybe what he meant by that was, uh, yeah, basically the horse should be soft anywhere and be able to accept that feel, follow that feel. And um, so to me, leading, everything bases, a lot of stuff bases around that leading because if you're going to put a rope on a horse's head uh, or, or a halter on it, um, it's so important that you sort of um, honour that, uh, you know, commit commit to it and, and honour honor that horse and and basically teach it to be very comfortable and yeah accept it you know really accept it not be frightened of it and I think um though we put a holder on or a bridle on a horse um sometimes we don't spend enough time getting that horse truly balanced and comfortable with it okay now talking about you mentioned softness then I've got a question the first question we're going to kick off with is from Jane and she has been doing a lot of leading with her horse and she got him to get nice and soft but she's now started firming up on the leading and the softness has gone backwards a bit so we just want you to address this so what's happened is her horse was a little bit sluggish and dull and she started working on the leading to kind of get off that and has firmed up a bit to try and bring him forward, get a bit of more life into him. And so she's asked for a bit more of an active walk. She's popping the flag on her leg. She's firming up a bit in that lead rope. But she feels that he's starting to go backwards. He's a little bit more angry and more defensive than he used to be. And he has started to try to bite her when she's leading. So the question is, what do you think she might be doing wrong? Her connection was great when they were going slower and it was nice and soft. But now she just feels like it's slipping. Yeah, um, 
you get a horse to accept feel and, you know, it starts off a bit slow and, you know, there's that soft feel kind of thing where you put a soft feel in and, it, you know, a bit of energy through that lead and the horse softly moves. And we were talking about this a lot at the last clinic about, you know, speeding up the rain speed and I, I call it rain speed, but it could be rope speed. And the reason why we have to speed up that rain speed or rope speed is because sometimes a horse goes to run backwards quickly and then suddenly it hits pressure on its pole, for instance, if it was tied up or something like that. And also when a horse is going faster or we panic a little bit if it spooks or so, you know something happens, then our rain speed gets a lot quicker and then the horse gets a shock because it's not used to it. Or if it doesn't get a shock, it'll just kind of brace against it, um, you know, through its, through its whole body. So um, building a... A, a, a faster rain speed is very important to um, add another level of um, trust in leading and also confidence um, and, and also just gives them better tools. So it's really important to do it. So I think where we go wrong with building a, a faster rain speed is we can sort of build faster and when we get on brace, we end up just pushing and pushing and pushing on the brace. Whereas once what, what I would start to do is I'd, I'd start to pick up like a, a feel on the horse and I'd sort of go at a certain speed, the, the speed that is soft and comfortable with. Then I'd build uh, a little bit more uh, speed in that as in, you know, you could say strength in it, but you're just going a little faster. As soon as you feel the horse starting to shut out and lock up to that extra bit of intention in that lead rope, instead of just pushing and holding on it while it wrestles and trying to push through it, I'll go to a kind of quick, firm, uh, like a push to say leaning's not available. So it'll, I'll, I'll actually, it won't be necessarily a bump, but it'll be a bit of a kind of a, a shove to say that's not available. And then as soon as you feel the horse kind of like, it'll shock a little bit and, and, and make one slightly quick movement. And as soon as you feel that movement, you back off a little bit uh, and then come in again soft. And basically what it's saying is don't shut out on that lead. Don't shut out on that lead. Um, it's, and instead of kind of just hanging in there while the horse starts to wrestle and then you know, they get angry and irritable and start to bite, um, you sort of get in and you get out and then you start again. And what that does is it sort of says that pushing the boundary is not available, let's try again. And usually if you do it like that, you'll, you'll, you'll be in, you'll be out, the horse will get a bit of time to think about it and then you'll go again until the horse starts to uh, accept that, that faster range speed and then you can just go faster and faster and faster and the horse kind of comes along with that. That can be in forwards and backwards, you, you can do that. Now in popping the flag, you've got to be careful that, you know, you're not just dragging and popping and dragging and popping. That'll just cause a lot of problems. You're best off sort of starting slow, as I said. And if you have to pop the flag, the idea is to get the horse to push back. As soon as the horse kind of releases a little, you loosen, give it a little break for it, and then you go again. So you, so you do that upward leading uh, when you want to go faster uh, in a lot more transitions opposed to sort of, you know, I'm going faster, 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 faster and dragging, expecting a big response. I'll go right back to a slow walk and I'll start again. And as soon as I feel a certain amount of dullness, I might pop the flag, push the lead at the same time. And then if I feel a little bit of a spark and a bit of awareness, then I'll just loosen off and, and start again. So, yeah, you just kind of go at, yeah, at more transitions, give the horse a chance to reset, think again. And then soon enough, you'll find because you're only firming up on the bit where the horse shuts out and then, you, then you're giving it a break and going again, the horse will start to stay more open and then follow the feel all the way up. Um, but, yeah, most cases, yeah, when, when I show people this, yeah, they tend to just you know, stay in a little too long with the medium pressure uh, until the horse just starts to sort of, you know, just get good at blocking it. So we have to be careful of that. Okay. Next question is from Renee. Um, again, it's on the leading subject. She has had a horse only for six weeks. And from what she can tell, he's been trained by being driven from behind. He's terrified of any pressure from behind. So she's been watching all of your videos on leading um, and she needed to get him to float and she needed to get somewhere. So she's been giving him breakfast and dinner on the float so that he was comfortable. She, they did take a float trip. Um, but she couldn't get him back on to get home. So she's gone back to the leading work and she's realized that he has a really strong brace, both forwards and backwards, and seems to be completely shut down when she's using the flag. It's got worse since the failed float attempt. So she's wondering, how does she start to get him to follow the lead and soften? 
she's trying to take get him to take steps and any movement for now until he starts to go forwards and backwards and she's wondering if she should just concentrate on the leading maybe don't even go near the float um until she's got that leading right she just wanted to know what your initial thoughts were on how she goes forward yeah um so most definitely um stay away from the float till the leading's well uh, good I do the opposite though. Sometimes I take the horse to the float to enhance leading. The reason uh, I would do that, I'm not saying for everyone to do that, but the, but the, just, uh, the reason I do it is because um, if the horse has had a little bit of a traumatic experience in a float or scared around floats, it heightens their awareness a bit. And actually the horses that have uh, over the years learned to shut out pressure, some horses open up a little bit around a float, some horses shut down. So if it just happened to be one of those horses around the float, it's I've got a higher awareness. You can actually teach them to lead in that vicinity um, because they naturally stay more awake and aware because of that anxiety having the float around and you can offer them softness in the lead rope. Uh, whereas sometimes horses out back out in the arena in a very quiet place, they can be very, very dull and you know, you've got to do other things to wake them up. So, there is sometimes a positive of being around a float when teaching leading, but not some horses that have been traumatised near a float and actually have started to really shut out near the float. Well, that wouldn't be good for them. You'd want to be further away from the float somewhere else to teach them to lead. So there is a, uh, you know, there is pros and cons. And, you know, some horses, yeah, you would be near the float, some you'd be away, as I, as I just explained. Um, but definitely go away and teach, teach leading. Um, like the last question, uh, you know, building a better rein speed or rope speed so the horse understands that. Um, so somehow we've got to bring our horses to awareness and the hardest thing, and it's even at clinics, you know, I'm, I'm working through a sort of a brace in a shutdown horse, getting them to wake up. And, you know, like at the last clinic, we had a, had a mule and she, she was a nice little mule, but um, the first three days were spent getting her in the right frame of mind to learn. And then the learning started or, you know, nearly four days, uh, and that was to get her aware, let go of uh, separation, anxiety, different things like that. And then when she was in the right state of awareness, she was very soft uh, and easy to train. Whereas before that, she would be shutting out and heavy and lean and nibbly and all that sort of stuff. So it's it's not just about going and leading. It's about, you know, identifying how how far gone your horse is in that sort of, you know, that dark place of being shut out or shut down and figuring out maybe we have to get the horse out of that place a little bit. Um, you know, I have ways and means of doing it, but I don't expect everybody to be able to just, you know, click their fingers and make it make it happen. So, um, but a, around your horse, something you want to, you know, start to do, even if it's not aware of the flag. Um, there's something I do around a lot of horses with a flag is is I'll just go around them, and I'll put the flag in different positions, and even if the flag goes into a position that he was once scared of, like behind him you know how he, uh, he, he's scared of pressure behind him well you can put the flag in different places and give it a shake in a spot that he actually is quite uncomfortable and he'll kind of go oh and he'll get a bit of a fright and then you take it away and you just go uh, I just noticed you're aware there that's nice to know um, because you have to bring him back into a state of awareness and when he gets that awareness then you go back to helping him with the lead soften and you might just do some slow forwards and backwards lessons but if he dulls out, you do something to get him aware. And sometimes it could be just hanging the flag just above one ear and the horse goes, whoa, what's that? And they'll pick up, they'll, they'll come out of that sort of set hard place that they're in and they'll get, uh, you know, round eyes. They'll open up a little bit and go, oh, what's that? And, and while they're in that frame of mind, you might pick up the lead rope and just go, yeah, just rock backwards and forwards until they sort of let go of the brace of that nervous, um, you know, awareness that they've got and start to follow that feel. So it's, 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 it's just a matter of trying to bring them into a higher state of awareness but not cooking them and getting them too frightened. Um, you know, so you're actually pushing their threshold a little bit so that they, they can't sort of hide. Um, and then when they just come out of that, that, that state of hiding, you sort of, you know, you wriggle them around a bit and do something with the lead, get them soft. Um, also, when you go to faster rain speeds, you're going to have to look at, um, you know, instead of push, 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 you might push and put one kind of bump in the rope and the horse will go, oh, what was that? And then when they're at that bit of awareness, you come in soft again and, and ask again because the horses that have started to just brace, they, they've learned to brace to sort of a fair bit of pressure. So 
and shut out to a fair bit of pressure. So, you know, more pressure doesn't work. It has to be um, effective pressure that makes them think. And that, I guess um, that's where you come in with a bit of a sort of a quick shove with the rope and then you disappear again and then you go in again soft and then give them a quick shove with the rope because that makes them go, oh, what's that? I can feel that. And then you go in soft until they're awake and you can, um, you know, make the rope go a little faster to get them to follow it. Um, because most horses that have been trained before, yeah, they, they, you know, people think we're all training these wild green horses, but, you know, there's a lot of horses that, that come along and they've had 10 years of just shutting out heaps of pressure. And I mean lots of pressure, like, you know, people with, you know, stallion, you know, holders jamming on them and all this sort of stuff and spurs in their ribs and, you know, just a whole paraphernalia of things. And um, you have to find some way of just get into their head a little bit to get them to open up and then show them that their softness uh, within those pressures, which which they've actually sort of, you know, realised that, that they thought that there wasn't. So it's not easy. Um, and that's why people go to, you know, different forms of like clicker training, positive reinforcement and stuff like that to sort of get a horse interested again and in doing things. And, yeah, there is some benefit in that sometimes, but there's also a, a danger in that too because a, a lot of horses um, have been shut down and they're already uh, food obsessed. Um but they shut down to pressure, so so it can actually food food can just keep them in a in an unhappy place if we're not careful. So you know, there's there's dangers in everything, um, but really it's just trying to figure out how to get them to wake up enough, um, and all that other stuff. Like like I said with the mule, we we spent the whole time like one lesson was I'd walk up to her in a smaller yard, and when she was shutting out, I had to do something big to get her to reset her mind a little, and then I'd walk away and do something else until we could approach her and she'd stay quite aware. And then she became really soft and she'd follow us around and she was aware of our space and it made her feel really good. Um, though I had to put a reasonable amount of pressure on her to get, get to let go of that strong thought that she had. Once she let go of it, she went, oh, this is good. I'm not stressed out being over there. I'm kind of here and I, and I, and I understand you guys. And, um, and, and she, she became really happy in that place. So that bit of pressure was worth it because to get to the other side was um, better than them staying in that that bad place that they're in, you know, months and years on end. Renee, you might need to keep us posted on how you're going with your horse. It sounds like there's a fair bit that Mark would be able to help you with that one. And the next question, Mark, is from Angelica, and it's just sort of going to the next level of leading into lunging angelica has been she has a mare who was driven with a stick by her trainer and now suffers quite a lot of anxiety and helplessness so in the last five months she's been working on connection following a feel and now what she's doing is working walking in a circle she was doing it really well her ears were forward and she had soft eyes but when she's clicking her forward to go into a trot she has stopped and given an angry kick jump or a stop and she's definitely showing signs of being cr cross with her. So Angelica is wondering how can she move forward from here? Is lunging on a circle perhaps reminding her of her previous training? And does she need to do the trotting circle? Is it that you know? Is it for any particular reason? And what are the training benefits, please? Um, there's no problem with put, like first I'd, I'd sort of make it uh, you know about trotting circles and lunging and lunging is not a bad thing done right. Um, but undoing lunging, sometimes you might go away from it for a while. Now, what are the benefits of putting on a horse on a trot circle? You can sort of warm them up a little bit. They walk. They can do some soft transition at the walk. It gets them thinking to the inside rein softly. You know, you can get them doing little turns, you know, turn that into sort of close contact body control, then go back out on a circle, give some freedom, let them flow a little. So going out on a circle is good, but circles aren't good for teaching young horses to steer. So... Um, I like to establish steering on a young horse um, and an older horse even that doesn't know how to steer, the ones that have been going around in circles just looking to the outside. Uh, those horses, I'd send them out on a straight line on a long lead and then do a U-turn and come back and send them out again and things like that. So I know by the time they get to the end of the rope, they'll follow the field back softly. So I, And then I might start a circle by doing triangles and stuff like that. That's the steering I'm talking about. I'm, I'll, I'll go into the transition. but So, so you know, a horse that's really you know, just gone around stiff, I send them out and redirect them back. So they actually sort of turn and shape shape into that turn and come back and they start to relax out on the long line without feeling all stressed. Um, so, you know, and they're going towards their thoughts when they go away and they're going towards their thoughts when they come back because uh, they're thinking with that 
you know, that direction that they're going all the time and following the rain. So, you know, straight lines, turns into triangles, into squares, into, you know, yeah, and then and then that then that circle becomes a series of little straight lines and corners if you want um, until the horse is really comfortable and connected to 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 that rope or the rein that it's following. So, um, and you know, there's a way I get horses to go out on a circle where I get them to grow. Um, so I pick them up close and I'll pick up and get them to grow in the wither, soften and and just travel out at a soft walk and that really gets them to shape up nice before they go out instead of just going out on their forehand and plonking around but um in regards to your horse and the bad feelings it has from past training um you can teach it still how to lunge it's just how you go about it and how soft the horse is before you go into the next gate so you know when i do a riding transition i say to somebody i want you to walk your horse up till it thinks soft it has a soft trot thought and, they go, and, and they're thinking, oh, a trotting transition. So people think trot and the horse goes into a trot and it gets a hard thought and then it has a, has a worried trot, whether that be on lunge or under saddle. Whereas I would say do walk transition up and then back and then up and then back. And this is on the lunge line, you can do this. So firstly, get them to walk out really soft and thoughtful and light. So you might do some close in hand work where your horse is kind of walking around soft and it softens in the eye and it's carrying a nice soft bend walking around and then you pour it out with the inside rein a little and then you do a leading lesson with it where you push the knot forward and it walks up a little bit and then you slow it down and then and eventually that leading lesson gets um, further away from you on a longer rope so you pick up your leading hand the horse follows up and then you go back again instead of going like a big cluck or something like that if that cluck is represented trot and that horse has got worried every time it hears a cluck or a kiss then you take away the cluck and the kiss because that's like it might be a sharp transition for the horse. Um, and you just do it through the field in that walking transition where you go up and then down and up and then down until the horse is kind of really kind of just moving up nice and fast when you walk and then down. And then all of a sudden you'll see this moment where the horse is going, you know what, I'm thinking pretty soft in the trot. And I just, you know, if I trotted right now, I'd feel pretty good. Uh, and you can see when a horse gets that trot thought, it's very, very clear. Once you, once you see it a few times, you'll know, what I mean and if you're looking for it you'll know what I mean and you'll see the horse go hard thought trot or you just go back down the walk and say let's keep walking and work on that walk transition then you bring it up to walk again and then 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 you push up with that knot as you're pushing that lead forward um, and if that horse is following the feel up nicely and it's going oh, I'm having a soft trot thought well then you just keep that little push until the horse you know dribbles into trot and then as soon as it dribbles into trot, some start to trot for a few strides and then they go, oh, that's right, this is lunging again and they start to get worried. Before they get to that state, uh, you just slow them back down again. And you just go back down and then up again until they're soft. Um, and, and you just go like that. And and um, and there are benefits, but if you didn't, like for, for, for trotting a circle and stuff, but if you didn't want to do it for a while, it's not going to be the end of the world. It, um, you know, there's plenty of other lessons you can do. And then when the horse is really soft for those other lessons, you find the horse will just lead out on a lunge and trot won't be a problem because the pathway to lunging would have been um, a different mindset that you've 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 encouraged a good mindset. So by the time it goes back to it, then it may not be a problem at all. So um, yeah, the reason horses are traumatized on a lunge is because everyone's gone, you know, been taught to cut corners and go, oh well, just send it out, send it away from energy. Uh, so steering. Uh, is smashed in with energy at the same time. So the horse is steered with all this energy and then it just gets pinged out there with all this energy. Um, and then it feels like it's sort of running away from that energy. So then it runs around with a troubled mind. So that's why lunging is for most horses very traumatic. It's just because of that. But if people didn't cut corners and they taught their horse to lead well and then taught it energy was just energy, it wasn't something they were escaping from, then all of a sudden they'd have a horse that goes, oh, energy's fine. Steering's fine. I'm comfortable and I'm balanced, and and then they'd be so much easier. Mark, the next question for you is from Greta. She's actually coming to a clinic in a couple of weeks' time, in about four weeks' time. She's got a six-year-old off the track thoroughbred who slipped and fell in the float on the way uh, recently to to somewhere that she was staying. She was bruised and she cut her leg. She has since um, travelled in a float a couple of times with no incidents. But Greta's wondering. What are your thoughts on that fall in the, in the float? Do you think it might affect her in any way now? Do you think she'll be okay to have good experiences traveling still? 
Um, I think she's a little bit concerned because it's going to take her four hours to get to you to this clinic that she's coming to. And what she's wondering is, do you th- what are your thoughts on her using a calming pace to help her relax on the trip? Do you think it's necessary? Or is there anything else that she, be, she could be doing to help prepare her? They're doing lots of leading exercises, forward and back, that sort of thing. Yeah, um, talk to a nutritionist or a good nutritionist about calming paste. Um, I had somebody um, that that, that uh, gave me some information on it because a lot of calming paste and magnesium. And I believe that calming paste only works is if, if it's a magnesium-based calming paste, if it's um, the horse's lacking magnesium. But if it's magnesium levels are fine, it won't do anything. It's just um, like an expensive paste um, that may not do anything. So, but... Um, I would definitely talk to a good nutritionist or someone who knows about, you know, the minerals and all the things and, you know, because it may not do anything and calming paste, the problem with it is, um, like anything, um, a horse, a calming paste is not enough to help a horse deal with trauma under a lot of stress. So it's just going to calm it nerves a little bit. It's not like a set. It's not like a sedative. It's not going to sedate it. So if the trauma is bad enough, um, you know, the horse is still going to come out. Adrenaline is going to fly and, and, and whatever. So um, education will be the best key to it. If if it's magnesium deficient or the calming pace help take an edge off nerves, then, then I don't know. I've, ne- I've, never been, I've never been a fan of stuff like that because I like to know where a horse is at all the time um emotionally and where it is when i'm training it um so and i've heard stories where people have used calming pace and and they've had good results um i don't know if it's been in floating but different areas where they've horses are calmed down a lot but as i say when you go to things like you're better off talking to a nutritionist or something like that who knows more about that that sort of stuff before you go and invest in that sort of thing uh i like to have my horses um as they are uh, so I know exactly where they're at with their emotions when I'm teaching them. So I don't, I don't leave any stones unturned. And I think that's really important to think about is you want the horse in its natural state of awareness. So you can be the best trainer you can be to help that horse through that, that situation. Um, and that's why, you know, people who go down the road of sedating horses and stuff like that, they might get a false sense of security. And then all of a sudden, you know, there's, you know, things go, go wrong. So, so yeah. But um, to he- the first part of the question I'll answer as well, which is what's going to happen after that accident? You know, is the horse going to be worse or better? I've, I've seen horses have an accident in a float and it's actually made them travel better because it made them think and then they, they actually started to sort of um, travel better because all that stomping and that wriggling and that fighting, they, they, they did... Sh- some horses managed to not shut down, but they actually started to think a little bit and not get so reactive in the float. Um, I've seen some young horses, even ones that I've had ha- ha- helped train to load, get really panicky. Uh, one just recently, um, you know, came to a clinic. She, she was loading beautiful, and um, but she, she went on her own for a little bit, got panicky, banged her head, but she still loaded fine. And I just said to the owner, keep her with company for a little longer till she's had more experiences, but she traveled all the way home really nice and was quite settled in the float. And after that panicky accident, um, her loading was was really was going really well. And uh, I thought she'd stand in there really quietly and she was comfortable. So so I was kind of happy with it. Um, but but she had um uh, you know, we, we only did the I only did the, you know, hold a you know, hold her started her and, and stuff like that and got a loading, but and she had had a lot of experience, but she was a she was a mare that could could deal with pressure pretty well and um and she went well. And there's another fellow I, uh, I helped. Uh, he organised a clinic uh, a while ago for tra- trail riding club up in Queensland. He used to be a truck driver and he was involved. Uh, they used to get him to load tough horses all the time. And uh, there was a big truck accident down on the coast somewhere years ago. And uh, the ho- the, it was a really bad accident. And the horses were pretty well piled on top of each other. And there was a bull in the truck as well. The bull died in the accident because they all you know stomped him. Um, because the, the, the angle of the truck at the time so it was just like a uh Gosh. so they had to cut into the truck in a certain way to get the horses out um so that yeah, the only one that didn't survive was the bull that was was in um up the front um so anyway he had to go back and load all those horses again 
from where they were left for a while and they might have been left somewhere for about two days and he got them all on and they and they loaded i don't know the story after that but um and i've heard other people that have had really traumatic experiences and the horses have gone straight on and, and still kept traveling now i haven't seen those horses and, and and looked at the camera as how they're traveling but they loaded and it, you know just just kept going uh you know traveling but um and i think horses are interesting in the sense that um then some horses don't you know if, if she's really scared in a float and it's and it's her being braced and tra not traveling well that's made her fall over then yes yeah, she, she could be one that will not go in again so so what i'm saying is i've seen horses that have fallen over and gone back in floats i've seen other horses that have fallen over and petrified of going in after that but they're always petrified anyway they they you know so um so yeah in the sense of reloading yeah. her i don't know what's going to happen but you do have to do your homework and I'll give you a bit of a rundown on a few things you can really think about working on, which is really important. One of the things is the leading, uh, which you're already doing. It has to be perfect if she's already had a trauma in a float, as in you have to have her feet so soft and her mind so soft in that holder, uh, rocking backwards and forwards, nice hindquarter yields, move the front over, just nice control over so she trusts that lead rope. 100% because that is the key when she starts to freeze up when you're loading and get hard on the floor start to worry about things that helps her uh, start to move softly and start to trust the floor trust herself in the float so um, so when I say obedience like I don't use the word obedience in uh, my little slave that I'm gonna video and put on Instagram so all my friends can see it's cool tricks um, I talk about obedience in the sense we, we need obedience to empower horses to be soft and have an alternative under pressure that's going to get them out of trouble opposed to them not having any alternatives and get lost and just completely panic. So uh, this is where obedience is so important. Um, so, you know, we might, um, you know, some people use it, you know, they might click a train their horse into a float or they might, you know, give them a bit of food and leave the float out and, get the horse interested and wait, get them curious, work under their threshold, get them sort of slowly going into a float, all that sort of thing. But I say to those people, I said, you may have given your horse enough, um, you may have taught your horse enough to get into trouble, but have you taught it enough to get out of trouble? And to me, that's the key. So the unloading and the traveling is the key. It's not about getting the horses on. So if uh, we can't just get a horse in a float, we have to get them to know how to survive in a float. It'd be like setting someone to, to you know, Afghanistan. Um, you know, well, you've given them a plane ticket to Afghanistan. How are they going to survive over there? You know, you've got to give them a few tips to be able to survive over there and, and in a relatively sane sort of manner. So when, when you load a horse, it's the same thing. We do have a lot of videos on this on the membership that where Mark is actually helping on getting a horse prepared for float loading and uh, doing lots of things that you may not have considered, you know, that goes beyond the leading, um, you know, just making sure that they are comfortable in a moving float and a noisy float and things like that. So he'll get in and do all sorts of things inside the float with them. So um, he also goes through step by step, really quite in a lot of detail about getting them on and off and getting checking sure that they're right. So I would go through the float loading section which is on the membership i think that's going to help you a lot and you're just looking for areas of brace and making sure that you can try and correct that so yeah. i'm just i uh, interrupted you then mark because the quality isn't brilliant and um, i know you're giving out a lot of information but i just won't, don't want people to lose it and um, so i think we might just leave it there so thank you very much no worries thank you jenny well i'm in a bit of a stormy weather at the moment and i think the uh, 5g's yeah not so great because of that so I apologise, everybody, but yeah, ho hope it, uh, you got most of that. But yeah, thanks, Jenny. Thanks, everybody. You can learn more from Mark online through his online training videos. Just search Mark Langley Horsemanship. There's over 380 training videos which everyone has access to with a seven-day free trial. If you like what you see, it's just $15 a month from there. That's help where you need it.